Yeah, so um, my name's uh, Paul Blank. Um, Evans and uh, our other co-founder, James Han, um, who also was 30 under 30. Don't stop talking about that. Um, <laughs> and um, as you can tell, I am um, by far the oldest member of Checkbox. Um, uh, in fact, I'm older than Evan's parents. Um, <laughs> and uh, when we first met, I, um, I uh, had them over for dinner and discovered that sad fact. Um, so um, I, uh, my background um, in the context of legal and technology, I read law at Brazenose in Oxford. I went to the bar there. Um, I was uh, a terrible lawyer. Um, and so um, I moved into technology. And I've run a number of pretty well-known technology Firms, um, uh, if you're donated to charity, I launched Everyday Hero in this country, so all the not-for-profits use our technology, um, and uh, a whole variety of uh, reg tech and financial tech technology in the banking sector more recently. Um, and uh, I will be talking a little bit about reg tech, uh, fintech, and legal tech, and just to bring you up, uh, up to speed. And I, um, for my sins, uh, it's a new area, but it's something I'm quite interested in. And I um, uh, advise uh, Boston Consulting and the third um, bridge research in the area of reg tech in Australia. So that's what I'm mainly going to be talking about today. And before we jump over to Peter, I might just introduce if, um, no, if, if people who haven't heard about Checkbox might briefly introduce um, what we do as well. Um, so basically, as a technology company, we help uh, organizations build software without code, specifically around automation and workflow. So our technology looks uh, like this. So it's actually a visual drag and drop where you can build forms, tables, document automation, workflow, business process management. So it's really the whole package um, in getting um, legal services uh, delivered in a digital and automated way. Uh, so we work with um, a few people in the room already, so it's good to see some customers and partners in the room. Um, but that's kind of what we do, and we can talk more about that afterwards. But I think maybe I'll hand over to Peter to just introduce yourself briefly. Sure. I'm Peter Campbell. I, I'm the Client Solutions Director at Hall & Wilcox. I'm not actually a partner, but that's a great idea. I don't know <laughs> something about that. Um, so my job is to kind of curate and support the Smarter Law Program, which is our innovation, our response to the industry changing. Um, and so I work a little bit in the IT space, a little bit in the innovation space, so that's me. All right, awesome. So we might jump into it and um, have Paul run us through RegTech 101. Great, thanks. <coughs> Just going to jump up here, so. So um, what I thought would be uh, really useful uh, is to give you an, a rough idea about all these categories that you keep hearing about. And the general theme I want to pass on is that this is all really super simple. But um, I think a lot of um, uh, professional services um, and uh, really across all sectors are a bit confused about what reg tech is, what fintech is, what legal tech is. And really the, um, the core answer to that is it's just simply um, all technologies. Uh, and they're all technologies that help you improve your business, either through front of house by building tools that you can sell, and in the context of law, um, uh, there are uh, lots of opportunities now for law firms to use legal tech and reg tech and fintech technologies and to build and sell solutions to their customers, and that's happening all the time now, and it's a new revenue stream, front of house revenue stream. And along with that, um, in the context of, I guess, legal operations and in-house counsel, there are many opportunities to uh, reduce risk, increase efficiency, um, and allow yourselves um, to be focused on work that is much more high value, um, and that's why this is becoming very an exciting space for many of you. Now, before I just crack on and, and start talking about red tech, can I just get a feel? How many of you here are from law firms? If you just put your hands up. Okay, great. And how many from in-house counsel or in-house? And are there any regulators here? 
Okay, it can't be mean about the red, too mean about the red. <laughs> uh, so, no, um, and so I guess my, my point is you are largely, I know there's some uh, folk from advisory um, here, I think Peter, Peter Zing and um, some folk from PwC and some FIs as well. Um, you are all the key stakeholders in these areas. Um, and when we look at um, reg tech, it's generally uh, thought of as technology that really helps with compliance and risk management. But it's a lot more than that, and there's a lot more overlap into the legal space. So um, this, what I'm going to go through now is very FI-focused, uh, so financial institutions-focused, because the real urgency has come. Reg tech kind of emerged um, as originally a subset of what they call fintech, which is just financial technology. But it's actually much bigger uh, and all-encompassing because it goes across simply every sector. But it's been the financial institutions that um, have really led the way. So a lot of the data I'm showing is new, and, um, but it's very up-to-date, but it's largely driven by uh, financial services and information that we could get um, working with Expand FinTech Control Tower at BCG uh, um, across the globe. So they, they categorised it as um, a whole variety of uh, um, categories here. Um, I'm just going to quickly run through them. Um, you'll see later in the later slides that verification and monitoring are really important areas. And this is very transactional. So if you've got any, as law firms, um, customers that are in the FI, things like AML, um, CTF um, are really important. And at the moment, that is, there's a very big focus in those areas in getting those transactional uh, regulation um, in, in, uh, in place. Um, then there's these other areas around um, reporting, both governance, uh, huge amounts of that, obviously, after the um, uh, Hayne Royal Commission. Um, and then data, um, risk analysis, uh, all speak for themselves. Um, and then this area of general compliance. And it's in this area that I think there's a lot of opportunity for um, in-house counsel um, and law firms, and basically um, across sectors. And I think this is where we're going to see a lot of growth in technology. To give you a flavour of how big this is, and why Evan and I have launched Checkbox, frankly, um, is the uh, amount of spend is enormous. Um, they are forecasting the increase in spend um, across, um, I guess, uh, all categories to reach $7 trillion by 2023. So it's an enormous amount of money. In um, uh, the global financial area, the uh, projected spend next year is about $100 billion. Um, so most large FIs, um, around 10% of their profits will be reinvested into uh, compliance and regulation and governance. Um, and the reason for that is it's the pe penalties are enormous. Um, so it's uh, staggering $342 billion globally uh, folks are being fined, and you're all aware of these sort of $700 million fines that the likes of CBA. Um, I'm having you. <laughs> I, I really doubt that. Um, <laughs> uh, Siri does this to me all the time. Um, so, uh, something like 15% of all employees in the big four banks are going to be focused in this space. So, reg tech is simply uh, an enormous, both weight on the, um, if you're a, from uh, an uh, advisory background, you would say it's a burden for the economy. I think um, Deloitte estimated it's $250 billion it costs the economy. So um, it, is, it is a lot. But from a uh, law firm uh, opportunity, it, it, it represents a lot of uh, service value to you. Um, and then RegTech, again, offers an enormous value for in-house counsel uh, in terms of uh, reducing their costs in these places. Now, the um, stakeholders we've mentioned, um, uh, 
I think 2019 really has been pivotal. Pivotal, um, and it's not just the Royal Commission. It is. It is. We are seeing as uh, businesses out in the market, uh, medical companies coming to us, um, uh, retail companies. Um, advisory companies coming to us looking to use our technology for solutions across sectors. And I think there is this kind of begrudging acceptance from mainstream IT um, who typically have these big platforms to start looking and focusing on this red tech landscape out there. Do you want to just move yep. on? And just as uh, a, a rough idea here, this is kind of the, the growth patterns, largely driven by the amount of uh, companies. Um, and we'll, we'll send you this information. It's, it's, it's quite useful. It's very up to date uh, for this year's. Um, and the number of firms that are being launched. And Australia is the third biggest hub. Um, so we really, for RegTech, so we're really punching above our weight here. And there are some great companies that you should all be curious about because a lot of them will be able to help you um, both from uh, front of house and back of house. Um, if you just go to the next slide. Yep. Um, and this is really where FI see the problem. Uh, I just want to sort of point out that they are very focused on transactional. So they are saying, look, our biggest problems are these transactional. They want to get on top of the numbers. Um, but this general compliance, this is where I think everybody should be focusing on tools <coughs> Um, and technology, whether it's classified as legal tech or reg tech, that is out in the market right now, that can uh, be useful for you. Now, some of that is AI, um, but most of it isn't. Um, the AI out there at the moment is very good at, uh, in this uh, verification and monitoring, it's easy to write those programs those, um, uh, that self-learn over big data sets. But when you are dealing with quantitative complexity that you are, as lawyers, are always dealing with, um, the AI is less helpful. Um, there are some great companies like Red Marker that are doing uh, technology to scan uh, uh, sort of uh, words for marketing and compliance and disclaimer statements. But often you'll find that the technology only gives you 80% of the result. So it's always going to require a subject matter expert like yourselves to be reviewing this work. So please don't, don't put your fingers up in the air and look for a magic solution because it isn't there with AI yet. However, there are some great um, initiatives. Uh, one I'll mention that is run by uh, the uh, uh, basically regulation as a uh, service out of uh, Data61 um, and they're looking at codifying law um, at when it's actually made so that you can automate regulation. They've been doing this for about 13 years so don't hold your breath but, but there is work happening in this AI space. Um, Evan, so this is the landscape uh, in Australia um, and we're a founding member of RegTech Australia, and we invest a lot of our time in supporting it. Um, it is made up of, um, um, it really does uh, break down to validation and monitoring, which is a lot of the FinTech, RegTech overlap, um, and uh, why the banks are largely supportive of it. And then this compliance and risk management, um, and if you, any of you want some advice on uh, who you should be looking, if you've got a specific problem, feel free to reach out to um, me or directly to the Reg Tech Association, Deborah Young. It's a great organisation. It's worth joining, worth exploring. So um, please uh, look it up. It's all for you. And from a legal perspective, you would be well served to have a look at it. So um, very easy and cheap to get involved. Nearly at my sort of, I've nearly finished talking at you. Um, I'm very passionate about asking you to be curious about all this. It is literally all, all this technology uh, cannot really be uh, categorised um, as the industry tends to do it as simply legal tech or fintech. 
you should be looking at all these things, especially as law firms, because you will be serving multiple sectors and there's a lot of technology that you will be able to either procure um, uh, on a SaaS basis and on sell to your customers as your own solution. Um, so that will range from anything from data breach apps to food labeling to a um, whole variety of uh, um, uh, firms we have seen um, make um, some good revenue off the back of uh, reg tech solutions out there. So I'm gonna to come to just one um, use case now. So, so I'll, let me translate that. It's a bit breaking up. Bad. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, this happened to us all where we've written an email and we've sent it to somebody who we didn't mean to extend it to um, and I just want to point out one general compliance it, you know you might be in risk you might be in compliance you might be in legal you know in a bank uh, all the banks that I've been dealing with which are big four Macquarie they've got different departments that deal with data breach all right I can tell you the majority of them have, this is their solution, which is if there is a data breach, you type in data breach at nameofthebank.com.au and it gets sent to some poor risk department and to then have to interact with the person who has had the data breach and they go through a very manual process. Um, and uh, that is uh, an example that was really clearly displayed in these uh, article in the Sydney Morning Herald with an ASX company, I think on the 1st of August, where someone had meant to send an email with the addresses in BCC, and they sent it in just in CC. Really easily done. Um, and it was pointed out by one of the potential investors, um, and it cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to remedy this. What actually happened was the in-house counsel didn't know what to do. You know, they had a process they notifiable data breach, you know, an amendment to the Privacy Act, um, pretty straightforward, but they felt that they had to get legal counsel, uh, sorry, outside counsel involved, so they had to get their law firm. They had to then get their, all their risk team, their marketing team, um, chief operating officer. It took over a month um, and hundreds of thousands of dollars to fix. Um, and uh, we have had, um, uh, law firms and in-house counsel build very simple apps um, on our technology that solve this um, and that suit their own internal um, solutions um, and go as far as advising them on when they uh, allowing their, their people that actually make the data breach to self-serve and collect all that information and provide all that information in a way that the regulator um, requires it with audit process, etc. So I think you'll probably talk about data breach later on as an example, but that, as just one general compliance, and there are hundreds and hundreds of these problems that can be solved by reg tech or legal tech solutions. So um, be curious is, is my message for you. Cool. Thanks, Paul. So now that you've kind of heard the theory behind reg tech, my job is to talk about religion and cabbage. All right. So the, um, the Ten Commandments is 179 words in total, and the European Union's uh, regulation for the sale of cabbage is 26,911 words, okay? Sounded a bit sus to me, did a bit of research, apparently this is a myth, but let's just go with it. The point is that regulation is becoming more and more voluminous and therefore hard to manage, and so I wanna walk you through, I guess, how people are actually doing this in practice, what we're seeing is happening in industry. So with this kind of problem, what are we actually doing? Um, well, we have people, we hire compliance experts, maybe in your firms, in the absence of one, it sadly has to fall into legal. And uh, when regulation goes crazy, we simply hire more expensive compliance experts and more compliance experts. So this obviously is the reason why there's a huge trend at the moment of compliance workers and spend increasing uh, year on year. But what happens if you don't have the resources? What if you've only got yourself? What if you're managing all of this yourself? Well, today I want to share with you how we've discovered organizations uh, are achieving compliance at scale. Right? How do you achieve compliance at scale? 
So I'm going to give you two kind of themes. The first theme is actually this concept of compliance by design. So if you can build compliance into the process, into the tools, then you don't need to actually rely necessarily on the humans, on the expert, to actually make sure that you're compliant. So I'll give you this case study, right? So we worked with a global insurance company and they had this particular cross between external and operational uh, compliance where they had to generate, of course, product disclosure statements, right? And so their current process was, you know, the legal team would understand it really, really well. They had account managers out on the field interacting with clients, but they weren't legal experts. So every single time they pitched a new product, they would have to go back to legal with some sort of templated draft and say, hey, is this okay? And legal will say, no, you can't use that. The ABN's wrong, of course. And all these things, and it goes back and forth, back and forth, and the customer receives kind of the, the service or the product two weeks late when it should really be on the spot, right? So there's a lot of error, a lot of delay to business that's, that's, that's happening here, and actually a lot of non-compliance from, from quoting the wrong, wrong ABN or not providing the same, uh, the correct PDS flow. So how do they basically solve this problem? Um, they built six questions, six questions, which walked you through factors like, all right, what product does it relate to? Is it home, is it travel, is it motor, right? And uh, through a decision tree, they asked other things like, what are some of the qualities of the product? Is it 10% uh, off if you pay before this date? Um, you know, do you get deals by, by coupling products together? Um, and other questions around you know, authorization as well, and you can see they've built in these kind of definitions and tips that guide account managers who are not legal experts, not compliance experts, to go and fill in this questionnaire. And so at the end of the process, they get their disclaimer. So they're on their iPad serving the customer, they answer six questions on the spot, and because the actual rules behind what the dis disclaimer should be has already been defined by the compliance and legal team, it means that the account manager can get the correct answer relieving the sign-off process as well and delivering the kind of uh, the, 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 the compliant outcome to the customer immediately at the spot, on the spot, right? And for the legal team, all of this is obviously stored in a system so there's still that control in place, that, that risk mitigation and record. Okay, so this is the concept of compliance by design. This is just one example, but you can think of how you might be able to bake in compliance into the process already. The second theme I wanna share with you is about empowering people through a compliance culture. So I think a lot of in-house teams today are also looking at how do we empower and educate the business to self-serve, to do a lot of the work that actually isn't necessarily legal technical, but just really process, right? And so how do you actually do that? So compliance culture is, a, is an important one. We did this one for a bank, right? So this one is around uh, APRA. They came up with this kind of new regulation around PEARS, which is, which is kind of like a, uh, kind of like a risk analysis. And uh, the problem was is that there's so many policies in a bank, how do you keep up with all of it? And that's the same with really any big enterprise. There's so many manuals, PDFs, intranet portals, links everywhere. How do you, you know, expect your, your, your entire company, your staff to actually stay compliant, right? So how do you actually build that in? Also, there was so much information, there was a lot of reporting clutter as well. So that was another big pain point for them. How do you actually track uh, whether the business was compliant? Because it was all offline. It was all emails. It was all spreadsheets. How do you know as a compliance or a legal function, which your job is to mitigate risk for the business, how do you actually stay, um, how do you get that transparency? How do you get that visibility? So again, how do you build this compliance culture? Well, building self-service tools for the business. And this is an example where people are registering certain incidents, like incident reporting and re register. But again, you've baked in a lot of the uh, rules and compliance policies in the system so that you don't have to read a PDF. You can just go through an interactive process and, and apply your own situation and learn by, like learn on the job or learn on the incident, I guess. Um, so things like, you know, was it suspected fraud? Was there money loss involved? Many different factors, like was it a system fault, person fault, product fault? Um, here it's actually calculating the loss as well. So you can do quantitative elements, it's not just a decision tree, it's not just yes, no's. You can actually go and um, calculate, depending on the type of breach, the, the expected loss as well, based upon your own internal policies. Privacy breach. So you can also bake into this process, was, was personal information actually lost? And if you go and click yes, it'll take you through a whole entire other process which, which asks things like, 
you know, what was lost? Was it medical information, financial information, identifi identification information? Um, we would ask things like, were less than 20 people involved or more, right? Things like that. And you can see that there's also kind of really uh, dumbed down examples of what does, you know, outside bank examples mean. So they've listed it out pretty clear. You know, the previous session was all about um, design thinking, you know, being able to kind of word it for your business as opposed to for you as, as lawyers. And so at the end of this process, you want to have a record keeping, right? So you actually have all of the responses and the questions and the comments all logged in an audit trail. So it's there on the record, which is obviously a big part of the Haynes Commission was that this control process wasn't in place. So having it built into a system means that it's always going to be there. And then finally, you can submit this to Workflow as well. So it actually sends off, gets the compliance officer to sign off on it automatically. Um, and you can actually set conditions to say, well, if it's a low risk, just, just lodge it in the system. Let's not you know, flood everyone's inbox. But if it is actually a high level of risk, let's go and, um, let's go and send an automated email for that kind of sign off from the chief uh, I don't know, security officer, chief privacy officer. Right? So all of that, you, you can imagine, can be actually faked into technology. It doesn't have to be emails back and forth and setting up meetings to get sign off. At the end of this process, you end up with a report. It gives you your actual risk. So depending on all those different factors you've selected along the way, it actually says, well, this is an extreme risk based upon that pairs risk matrix. And it also gives you some recommended actions, which is cut off by the screen, but obviously you can scroll in the live version. But it gives you all the kind of, this is the person you should talk to. These are the immediate actions you should do at the moment. Um, so all of this is, again, you know, passed on to the business so that it takes a lot of the initial triage and um, information gathering load off you as a, as a risk function. So at the end of all of this, you trap all of this on dashboards, right? So let's say we're doing the notifiable data breach. You can actually define which metrics you actually care about and um, notice, for example, sent an email to the wrong client is a very common one that's come out of the recent report as well. But other factors like my, my laptop was stolen, that's how I've lost some information. But being able to get that visibility across your business um, will automatically flow because it's a digital process now. The data is there. You can actually do something with it and make business decisions and mitigate risk and show your board, look, we actually, this was the results from the last quarter. This is what we're doing about it. And so please stop managing your compliance and regulation like this. It doesn't have to look like this, right? Or if we're talking to advisory companies, we often see it like this. It's these crazy macro, <laughs> macro Excels. <laughs> and this is just one Excel. <laughs> Typically, there's like 50 Excels that all talk to each other to, to come up with an outcome. You don't have to work like this, right? So the solution is, of course, technology. Technology is the obvious solution. You hear this all the time now at all the conferences, and I'm banging on about it. But actually, that's not really the secret, right? The secret is how you use the technology. And I've given you two kind of themes today to, to, think, to think about, and that is compliance by design and having this compliance culture. Cool? So that's kind of how we see it in the market today. So what I'll do now is I'll hand over to Peter, um, who lives and breathes this thing on the other side as an actual um, law firm. Great. And you'll have to click using a mouse, unfortunately. Yeah, that'll be fun. Yeah. Careful not to scroll or go <laughs> crazy. All right. Thanks for that. Always a nice touch for an introvert to get something else to play with. <laughs> right. Hi, everybody. Um, so, look. There we go. Left quick. The big theme we're coming across in this industry is change, as we know. Um, and really, I think what's resonated with me in the past couple of years is not the kind of change that's coming up, but the kind of change that's happening now. So everybody's scrambling, which is, uh, to some sense, is a good thing. Um, and I know you've heard about some technology here, but if it was tech that just made the difference, then people would go out and buy technology, and there would be their competitive advantage. Um, but we know it's not like that. So my focus in my career, I guess, and particularly in, in this firm, is how can we make the technology work in a way that's useful for us? And, and that's why I really love the, um, the trend towards design thinking, humanizing the practice of law, all that sort of stuff, because it's, it's about people. So my focus today is more what it's like to do these sorts of projects with, 
with a tool like Checkbox in iFirm. I'm talking a bit about Checkbox today, but it's not the only tool in our box. Um, and I want to share a little bit about what's worked for us and maybe what's not. So, a bit about Hall and Wilcox, I, I won't really say much other than it's a Melbourne firm that started in 1917. But in the past five years, it's spread out nationally off the back of an insurance uh, practice expansion. There's about 700 of us now. And about five years ago, the firm decided to um, grasp new law by, um, by the, the scruff of the neck and actually be involved in the discussion to evolve and be different. So it, it's our way of, of growing up with the industry, I suppose. So I look after the smarter law um, practice, I guess, in the firm. And there's, there's four main pillars that we have. We talk about engaging the firm and our clients in innovation. We talk about operational excellence to try and reduce the amount of effort uh, and cost in, in, and risk. We also uh, try and work with our clients in two capacities. Firstly, to try and be a bit more like a new law firm and give them a different type of solution. But secondly, help them along the journey, because I think law firms actually have more resources than in-house teams, and so we need to use those while we still have them uh, to help the industry move along. And then the last piece is working with universities uh, to try and bring new talent through into this industry, and that's a really exciting and rewarding piece. So if we think about the innovation challenges past, um, I've been in this particular sector for about 15 years now, and say 10 years ago, if I look back that far, there was lots of room for improvement that we could see, particularly coming into the sector uh, from another one, I thought, gee, wow, how come uh, we're not doing things better? But also, um, not much appetite, and particularly not very good tools. So. The lawyers didn't seem all that interested in changing because uh, what's that famous quote? It's hard to tell a room full of millionaires they're getting it wrong. <laughs> um, but I think that's changing. Um, but but the, the other piece was even when we found someone who was willing to engage in something interesting, the technology was hard. There, it was not just the cost, but it was even viability because there was a lot of things that needed building and a lot of things that failed. So now, uh, innovation's a new buzzword. I think clock, um, hands up who knows about clock? Right, yep. So clock has had a significant impact on the industry in the past few years because it's, it's found with legal operations, oh, there's, there's also an initi initiative, the ACCC, I think it's for value challenges or something, but they, um, They've actually described what it takes to build a better uh, operating function, uh, a better way of delivering legal services, so that's really helped. And I think the technology has moved along uh, tremendously as well. So with good technology, surely it's all really easy now, um, but actually I don't think it is easy. Um, so I'd, I'd be lying if I said it was easy to innovate in a law firm and also talking to in-house teams as I do more and more these days uh, it's, it's really about these things it's, it's lack of resources it's mindsets um, and, and so it's, it's really actually constraining how we can move forwards I won't dwell on these because it's a bit depressing in some senses but but these are realities that the legal uh, market has to deal with. So, although that's the case, in the past few years, I suppose, here are a bunch of things that we come across with clients and inside the firm that have had a renaissance. If we think of document automation, hands up who heard about it 15 years ago, like it, 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 it was pretty big, and sort of went out of fashion because it was hard and boring. Now it's actually coming back. Um, decision trees as well. We're, these are all the sorts of things that our clients are interested in pursuing, either us providing a service for them or them actually uh, setting it up for themselves internally with help. So those four there, collecting data more clearly, 
triaging processes, um, and then we get into a, another space like matter management through Zakia, process and workflow improvement. These are the sorts of things that are, uh, are selling like hotcakes inside the firm. So we've got good technology, we've got some good ideas. Uh, what's the other challenge? In our firm, um, and I think in a few others, Getting from idea to reality is not a single step. So innovation isn't, I've got a new idea. We heard about that earlier on. Innovation is I've got a new idea and I put the thought in and I've got all the way through, I've got some support along the way and then I've actually built something, but along the way I've tested it, I've involved the clients. And so, um, I've forgotten the firm, uh, one of the firms earlier on was talking about it we've had to spend a lot of time educating key people in our firm that this is the process we need to follow. Because the, the partners want to start, they, they say, I've got this idea, make it happen. So they want to just lob it over the fence and have it come out a couple of weeks later, maybe a week later, because they're going on holiday in that second week. Um, and then others have an idea, but then don't actually want to do anything else. So a lot of initiatives stop, even if they are good ideas. And so our, our smart law champions in the firm, we've spent quite a bit of time onboarding them to this process. This is one of the versions of our process. I'm still not happy with it because it looks more complicated than it needs to. That's because I did it. I, I need a graphic designer or somebody who thinks um, with a more humanistic perspective, perhaps. But the idea that you, you know, some ideas are big, some ideas are small, you need some support. And then these little circles we found were really interesting because they're the, the amount of the different people involved or stakeholders and the amount of effort they need to put in. And so showing them that there's not much effort up this point, but as you get down here, you're gonna be doing a bit of work. It really helps set an expectation for somebody as they're moving along this process. So um, how does that relate to checkbox? Uh, I guess one of the things to say is that technologies like checkbox, and I guess what I'm saying there is low code kind of environments, they cut down the cost of some of these things and they increase the engagement <coughs> of the people that you're working with. If the lawyers want to see you build something, and so you can actually build something um, more quickly than you would otherwise. So in terms of checkbox, key benefits for us and, and other low-code environments, I don't want to be a checkbox salesperson. Um, so checkbox, uh, the first thing is it's not rocket science. So we, we don't need developers to code most of what's in the platform. In fact, for us, the test was um, we, we wanted to know how long it would take us to learn how to code in the platform, and so I got the whole team together, and uh, I think I just threw the gauntlet down to Evan and said, all right, uh, we're giving you an hour and a half, and we learned how to use the platform in an hour and a half. Um, I even built an app in an hour and a half. I'm sure it was much better than anybody else's. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so that was good, and so that means BAs and other business users can develop in the platform. It's not that I don't want developers to develop. Uh, developers are great. But there's just one more step of translation if you've got a developer at the end. So you've got the SME, you need a BA in the middle, and then you've got a developer. With this sort of platform, in a lot of ways, I can cut out the developer. And so that's, um, that can lead them for the more bespoke, tricky things that we need done. So the second one is rapid development's possible. Uh, before checkbox, we did uh, you know, wireframes and crayons on paper, all sorts of things. And all of those work. I'm not saying they're wrong. But sometimes a lawyer wants to see something that looks a bit more polished. I remember once I sat down overnight and I did a whole, before checkbox days, I did a whole decision tree or one part of a decision tree in PowerPoint. And it took me a couple of hours to make all the screens look pretty and make them look like that. And the lawyer was just blown away and it put a whole new energy into the project. 
And I never had the heart to tell him that, that wasn't actually the app and it didn't do anything. <laughs> but uh, it worked all the way through. So it's about bringing ideas to life quickly. And then the third piece is, uh, I guess it's more of a mechanical thing, web delivery of the system. Um, and again, this isn't unique to checkbox, although Evan might argue it is, all of these things, but um, you know, a web delivered application is pretty important because you don't want to have to have a battle with IT when you're actually developing. So that makes you think, what about citizen developers? You know what I mean by citizen developers? No, citizen developer is really just a business user that writes applications. Uh, or in, in, the, in the legal environment, lawyers that code. Um, now where do I sit on that? Uh, I don't know if it's no or just on the fence. I, I really don't think that um, I don't think that all of our lawyers need to learn how to code. So it's, for me, it's more about how many. If somebody's interested in it and they've got that unique skill set, then that, and they've got some tools that are useful, it's a fantastic idea because you're, you're cutting out the middleman. You've kind of got the, the SME and the coder is all in one brain. It's just that's not as common as you would like to think it is. Uh, I don't think it is anyway. There are some that are really great. What I think is more important is there's actually another benefit from having other people involved in, in an application. The idea that you have a diversity of approach and, a, and opinion, I want to be virgin, um, a diversity of approach and opinion and backgrounds and ideas to build a better solution. So, so there's real benefits in having other people involved. So absolutely lawyers can code. There are lawyers in our firm that code. They're really enthusiastic and great and they deliver things much faster than a combination of two. I just don't think there's that many of them out there. So moving on to a couple of apps we've built in Checkbox. Uh, we've built quite a few things in Checkbox. Um, these are just a couple of examples and they're picked out for a particular reason. The, the first one here was a self-managed super fund assessor, and that's a pretty ugly decision tree. That was pre-checkbox. Um, and so this was where one of our banks that is a client came to us because people were coming in to uh, try and get a loan against their super fund, and it's quite complicated as to whether you're able to get a loan against your super fund. And so the people in the branches were not able to make those decisions. And they would ring up our lawyers, which annoyed them because we couldn't really bill for that time. Uh, and it would also take time and they would lose business. People would walk out of the branches. So one of our lawyers came up with the idea, well, let's make a decision tree to help guide them along that process. So we went down that path. And although that's a pretty ugly diagram, it's not the most complicated decision tree in the world. Um, but, well, maybe, maybe it is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I guess I'd just say I've seen worse. Um, uh, I've certainly seen prettier too. But um, the idea was that if we built this, then it would reduce the amount of time that we spent and, and help the bank. So we did the right design thinking like ideas. We got the bank in, we did workshops. We made sure we talked to the people who'd be using it, got all that right, and then the lawyer um, stalled because they got busy. And then we pushed them along a little bit, and then they stalled again, and then they stalled again, and then we pushed them on a bit, and they, they stalled again, uh, then we got someone else involved. Uh, and so it was quite a tortuous process. Then we did some pretend mock-ups in PowerPoint to make it look nice. We did all sorts of other things to try and get a bit of a, a kicker, and then we we, um, we just found it was dragging out a bit. And that's when we came across Checkbox, and in um, two days, they got the application that we'd specified into the system well enough to demonstrate and, and show. And then when the lawyers sat down and they were running through the trees, they found that that was the best way of them actually engaging with the, the subject matter. So it wasn't about that defined path I'd painstakingly made up on the couch, 
It was about testing all the different options and really thinking about the words that were presented at the various times. And so that was, that was what made a difference. Um, so I guess I'm ad advocating pushing things in front of the users as fast as you can, uh, as well as you can. Then we polished it up, then we got it out, and two weeks later the legislation changed <laughs> and the banks all withdrew from that, um, that whole thing. So, <laughs> so I guess the lesson there was it took us way too long to get from idea to reality. We learned a lot along the way, so, so the project was a success from a learning perspective, but um, it didn't give us a business benefit in the traditional sense because it just took too long. The other funny thing that happened actually was when, when we presented the tree in, a, in the question and answer format to the lawyer or to a partner, she looked at it and she said, that's completely wrong. We said, well, that's what you told us. And she <laughs> said, no, that's completely wrong. It was just because that she wasn't able to visualize it until she was seeing it in front of her. The second one uh, was uh, a bit more successful because we kind of started off, uh, it, it had, again, uh, we still document our decision trees in parallel with checkbox or sometimes before, sometimes after, because we find that, that um, that's just the way we work because we want to be tool independent. So if we wanted to move them all into any other tool, we want to be able to have uh, knowledge in, in one location. So FERB was really about, is this transaction going to have FERB implications? Um, clients needed the advice, the lawyers internally did, and there was a couple of SMEs in the firm that were getting sick of having those calls. So we, we threw it into checkbox sooner um, before it had been finished in their heads, but that made things faster when it came to getting um, getting feedback and improvements done on the app. And that was uh, essentially three months from beginning to end, and that's allowing for the stop start um, or the, the legal foxtrot. So we've also um, used uh, Checkbox and other apps for clients. So these are the sorts of things we're working on with them, sort of back to the things that are popular. Triage processes are all the rage. NDAs, people are still wanting to automate NDAs. I can't believe it, that was a, like a case study from clock four or five years ago, but it's still popular. Um, procurement contracts, that's a good one. Um, which contract should I use based on a set of questions and answers? Um, capturing instructions, um, all sorts of things there. And then the last, the last one that was more interesting for us was a thing called Clear. So um, in terms of Clear, that was a, uh, an app because we had a lot of uh, clients, self-insurers, who were insurance dependent firm, and so people were getting injured and then two or three later, two or three years later, were suing the company. Um, and so what we were finding is when we were getting those claims, it was too hard to defend them because no one had collected any evidence. Um, it was too late and couldn't find anything. And so that delayed the claim and it also made it more costly for the clients and the other side and us. So CLEAR was about uh, a set of questions and answers that people, or questions that people would answer to help them determine whether an incident is likely to have common law potential down the track and then helps guide them as to the sorts of things they should capture, store, and then uh, find a way to, to store it. So this was a picture of us with the clients in a room and we did show them uh, mock-up screens, uh, wireframes, a couple of questions, we got a workshop done, broke down, did little groups, did all that sort of stuff. Then we used Checkbox within a month to build uh, an MVP that we could send out to our clients. Uh, it was only built in a few days, but the month was, was testing and trying to convince the lawyers that it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect before we give it to a client. So we, we, we just said, this is our minimum viable product. So again, it made us, it helped us get there quickly and get it out to the client. Then based on the feedback, um, we then changed it, built more, enhanced it, 
and we've now released it to the market. So I'll finish up now with the lessons that, that we've picked up in going through these processes. I think we've heard it before today, start now, and innovation doesn't come without change. Prototyping early, that's, that's again really good, it's iterating often. There's people always sending links around now, the firm on our Yammer group and things saying, here is a link to this app, um, give it a try, have a test. Provide plenty of support to the SMEs. So we kind of do a bit of encouragement and then accountability, it's a bit of carrot and stick. When someone's got an idea, we give them as much support as we can to get to a point where it's shaped up. But then we work them to the point where they've made a commitment to actually finish. And we, we dangle something at the end, like maybe they'll get some fee relief or maybe they'll get uh, a case study in the marketplace or something like that. But you need, need both. Um, and, and you need to kill off a project if people don't own it. Uh, involving clients early, I guess the other thing, it's in line with what was talking about earlier, um, use a real methodology. Just don't do post-it notes and call it design thinking. Try and, try and follow a real method. Uh, there's a reason that those methodologies have been written and reviewed and used. Um, and it's not that easy, uh, but I think it's worth it. And finally, uh, don't overthink the MVP <coughs> because uh, minimum viable product in a in a law firm sense, is a high bar to achieve. As far as, as we're concerned, our kind of next steps, we, we intend to use Checkbox more with our clients going forward to the point where we've become a, a bit of a partner with Checkbox. Um, it's not the only tool that we'll push forward to our clients, but we found that it fits really well for a lot of clients, at least at the prototyping stage. And we think that by, when I come across in-house counsel, they're often interested in tools like this, but they're not quite sure how to configure, even though it is low code, they're not quite sure how to approach it. And we think we can add some value in the middle there by digesting their, their issues, um, coming up with some answers, and then helping, um, uh, and, and sometimes uh, recommending checkbox or helping them get it set up. And so we think that uh, in that kind of arrangement, we can see more clients because Checkbox comes across the same sorts of people as we do, um, and then we can basically get more done because I think it's about trying to get, get many more experiments happening um, as we can. So that's uh, about it for me. Okay. Great. Cool. So we have um, time for perhaps two questions from the audience, because I did promise you the world's first something. So we've got to leave enough time for that. So two questions from the audience. Yeah, over there. Hey. Um, you talked about building a reg tech that helps a private corporation put together um, regulatory compliance information for the regulator. Have you done anything for regulators that will help um, entities that have to report to the regulators to uh, comply more easily? Mm. Yeah. So. <coughs> um, so yeah, we've um, met with all the regulators and, um, and so regulators like APRA, for example, um, we were showing them tools that we built for a bank. And this bank uh, had wanted to um, have a tool where they, uh, their traders would be able to, uh, in counterparty um, transactions, work out what the right code was and, and it just took them ages so they would just type in a few questions and that would give them the answer. So really useful and compliant and their in-house uh, team were responsible for making sure that, that, it, that it was compliant. So you know, APRA loved that um, and on the same vein I've, you know, we've you know, had customers that are looking at um, in uh, codifying uh, AML CTF rules for Austrac possible um, legislations coming out for conveyances and in fact in uh, legals they're going to have to do their own client CTF. But I'll be uh, really blunt, they, they are um, reticent about um, using the technology themselves and um, 
I think this year, as I said, is pivotal, um, but they are quite risk averse, if I'm if I'm honest. And um, you know, they are going to take that they'll they'll happily, in all cases, set up sandboxes. You know, does everyone know what a sandbox is? It's kind of like a safe place to play, I guess. But those are places where you go to die if you're a uh, <laughs> um, if you're a if you're a technology company. So we, you know, I, I I want to I I want to engage the market. There's plenty of businesses out there that have literally hundreds and hundreds of problems that can be fixed by technologies whether it's in the monitoring, um, you know, AML, CTF space, lots of great businesses out there doing Arctic intelligence, a whole pile I can name in the marketplaces that are. And, and you know, you, when you engage with, we started with advisory, um, big four advisory, and, you know, uh, whatever you think, those organisations solve problems for their customers, right? And that's why the banks go, oh my God, we've got, we've got to do remediation. They'll go to the big four advisory to get it done, and then big four advisory will come to us and we'll build it, they'll white label it, they get paid a lot more money than we do. Um, but at the end of the day, it solves the problem. And I think um, I really, I'm a great believer in government and in power. I would love, I would give a APRA, uh, you know, uh, or ASIC tech box to codify their guidelines. It's, it's impossible for um, people to understand the licensing or the, and, but you know, we, that, that's not how you roll. Um, but you will, I guess, get there at that point. And I would just encourage you to, to actually go and talk to some of the people that you serve as regulators and see what they need. And I, I really feel sorry for, like, if you're a real estate agent and you have to suddenly do, um, you know, uh, a KYC on your customers, you know, there are, these guys can't manage their cash flow, let alone go through that process. Um, and so they're going to need tools. And I think it's the responsibility of the regulators to help them uh, with those. So sorry if I've been mean, but I think it's, um, I think that's, that I'm plain speaking. Yeah. Um, I can take that one. So <clears throat> in terms of AI, I think every firm, no matter whether you're legal or not, should be looking at those technologies, not necessarily from a, you know, hoping to get the business value from it today, but from an education point of view, from a capability point of view, you really want to make sure you don't fall behind the curve when it comes to those things. Now, in terms of where you apply AI today, that will be use case driven, right? It is where can we bear the risk that comes associated with AI? Um, you know, if it is about flagging certain alerts to, to then fr have a lawyer look at that, you know, rather than sifting through thousands of transactions, thousands of contracts, to have a machine do that and flag out the points where a lawyer should then spend more time, great, that makes sense because the AI isn't necessarily making the decision in that point. It's really just making what actually is even a bigger risk without AI, which is I don't have the bandwidth to go to a thousand pieces of information. So it's use case driven, yeah, I, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a good example. I've spent um, three months in Hong Kong last year with about 23 different FIs working, and, uh, and I literally engaged with each one of them, and a lot of technology, a lot of AI, and I saw a lot of good AI. But it is, um, as Evan says, they are specific use cases, and what they're doing, in things like procurement, as a good example, you want to flag things where they're, um, you might have made a double, uh, there may have been a double invoice for it. So it's flagging bits of data that you then check, you know. Um, and so that's its value at this point. It's moving really rapidly where it's numbers driven and it's giving a lot of value. But in your space, I think, um, you know, you want tools that help you today. Um, and uh, fortunately, um, you know, they're out there, there's lots of them. So. Please, as I, we said, reach out and we can introduce you to lots of firms um, in the marketplace and Australian ones as well. Cool. All right.
it. So unless anyone has any like burning questions, I do want to slip in this last part. Um, okay. So I'll just bugger off because you need someone to sit here. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is what's going to happen, right? So last year at another conference, we start, we decided to do something really crazy, and people were like, oh, that's that's insane. We did a live tech demo, right? Which is like a big no-no because you know Wi-Fi and you know, what if it goes wrong? What if there's a bug? You know, that's just a bad idea. We pulled it off, so we're deciding to step it up one level higher today here in this room. We're not only going to do a live tech demo of our platform, we're going to get one of you who have never touched a checkbox platform before. This could go terribly wrong. I've never been so nervous in my life. <laughs> we're going to get one of you to come up here and we're going to build an application in 20 minutes. All right, live for everyone. And uh, we did mention the NDA. It's going to be an NDA because we all understand NDAs and there's no sort of we're probably not going to be arguing as to how to phrase it too much as lawyers. So we're going to build an NDA from start to scratch um, automated with someone who's never, ever touched the platform before. So I'll need a volunteer, basically. Can someone volunteer? To, I all think, right. I think you should take the lovely audience member from the regulators to demonstrate the validity <laughs> of the technology. Okay. Really cool. All right, round of applause. OK, here we go. So I believe I am connected to the internet. And because there is a time constraint, we've got 20 minutes. I'm actually going to put a timer. Online timer. Oops. OK, let's do that one. So now, um, timekeeper, you know I'm not going to run out of you know it's, it's, time. It's going to be timed. All right, so let me just log in. So. <laughs> You've heard a lot about how easy this is to use. I guess you'll find out very quickly if it's not. Um, all right, so this is what we're going to do. So the, um, the journey is obviously everyone here has NDAs already. We're not drafting one from scratch. We have a template already, but we're going to automate it using Checkbox. Right? It's going to be a pretty simple NDA. It's the one that we use as Checkbox, so there's no one-way, two-way confidentiality, different jurisdictions and all that kind of stuff. We can do that. We're not doing that today. What we're going to do is just automate that NDA. So um, let us do the countdown. How do you use this thing? So 20 minutes. Is that right? Oh, no. OK, cool. It's start uh, no, yeah. OK, it started. All right, here we go. So what we're going to do is I'm going to set up the app for you. So we're going to go create a new app, and I'll just set it up, and then we'll call this our CLI NDA live demo, um, and we just call it version 1. All right, let's create that app. Great stuff, it's created. We're going to jump into the studio, and in a moment I'm going to hand it over to you, and I'll walk you through this process, okay? Um, all right. Great start. Okay, good. All right, so this is a blank canvas. This is how you start with anything, all right? And what we're going to do is I'm going to show you the NDA template first so you, you know what you're trying to work towards. So feel free to grab a seat there maybe. All right, so this looks pretty typical of an NDA. You have, you know, your... your uh, I guess your variable is what we call it. You change out the date fields, you change out the, the party names, the ABN, and maybe you have like a signatory you know, section at the bottom there. So it's a pretty basic one for now. <coughs> what we're going to do is obviously build all of the ways to collect the information. The system will then pre-populate the NDA and then generate it, okay? All right, so you're gonna learn a lot about checkbox. It's a pretty basic use case, but you learn quite a lot about it. So let's just start with you, um, filling in what you would like the user to see on the first start screen. So in the header, feel free to just type in you know, what you would call this tool. What would you call it? I don't know. NDA generator. You can be creative. Great. And then in the body, if you click into the, the body text, what do you want this start screen to say? You know, some instructions, some initial instructions, like this will spit out an NDA or something. Simple, we don't have all the time in the world today, so <laughs> we'll have to, uh, I'm watching the time. Um, good. Getting a bit aggressive there. I'm, I'm, Oops. I'm, <laughs> seeing, I'm seeing the numbers tick, we're only two minutes in, so we're, we're on the start screen. I've never actually done this ever, no rehearsal even, so let's just hope we can even do this in, in 20 minutes. All right. We're also gonna deploy it, by the way, so we're not just gonna build it, we're gonna actually deploy it so you can actually use it afterwards. All right, we'll, we'll see. Nice, I like it, awesome. Okay, now the next thing we want to do is basically pull in a form to capture some of the key information. So mm -hmm. I, I guess from the audience, what is some of the information we typically grab for an NDA? 
the basic ones. Like purpose. your purpose. Good. So we need that purpose. What else do we need? Okay, we're going to not do that today, but we could. <laughs> we'll need 23 minutes. We've only got 20. Um, you need the name of the party. Maybe the ABN as well, right? Cool. And the address, yeah, cool. Good stuff. So let's do that. So we're going to drag in a form. Just click and drag it into any way you like. Yep, great stuff. Um, and then you're going to click onto the form builder. This one? Yes, good stuff. So now we've jumped into the form element of checkbox. Now we want, uh, what was it? It was, let's get the party, let's, let's just give them some instructions. If you right. click paragraph, all right, and then uh, you can type into there, let's just say something like, um, I don't know, fill in the following information. So this is just the question text, fill in the following information. You're doing incredible, by the way. Um, and then we will, uh, let's give them a text input. So if we click onto text input there, all right, so we want the party name. So if we go into the label there where it says input text mm -hmm. and just rename, just get rid of that text and type in um, party name. Yeah, party name maybe. Oh, oh yeah. Because we've already, this is for checkbox, so the other party is already oh, okay. us. Yeah. So it's me, party name. Cool. Let's click text input again and we want um, ABN maybe. So if you just uh, click onto there and say, ABN, and we can do ABN lookups as well, so you can actually do the live kind of ABR API call. We're not doing that today either, but we can do that, so with ABN, very good. And then let's chuck in a date field, because we want to know when this is beautiful, right? And we can just change that to today's date, maybe. Mm. Yeah, agreement date. Yeah, and are you fine with the formatting? You're mm -hmm. fine with date, date, month, month, year, year? Yep. yep, good. I don't think we need to change anything else here. Um, that's really good. All right, so if you just click the X button, um, oh, click the X button there. Yes, all right, so we're back into the studio. Now we wanna get the express purpose and let's capture that separately. So if you drag in a text box and put that after the form, good. I'm gonna teach you something really cool. So there's this thing called variables okay. in checkbox, okay? Oh, that's fine, that must be the Wi-Fi playing up. It should be fine, if it doesn't work, we'll blame the Wi-Fi. Um, so, we want to use, we want to be personalized. So once we find out the company's name, we want to refer to them as the company, all right? So to do that, what I want you to do is, uh, sorry, I made you jump around. If you click back onto form for a second and jump back into the form, mm -hmm. you see where it says party name? Yeah. If you click into that. Now at the moment, the system's automatically told you that this variable is called txt2. Mm -hmm. It's generated that by, uh, just by, autom like just automatically, so it's convenient. But txt2 doesn't really mean anything for us, right? So we want to kind of rename it. You can just rename that. So if you click there, and let's rename it. Um, yep, let's just rename it um, all in capitals. And I'll tell you why in a second. But let's just all caps party name. Yep, and you can't have spaces. And it's actually told you that. So in the system, it says that's not a valid variable. Let's keep it as one word, party name. Good, awesome. Um, and then while we're here, I might as well get you to rename ABN as well. So right now it says TXT3. If you rename that to ABN, then we're doing amazing. We've still got 14 minutes, just <laughs> FYI. <laughs> um, and then on the date field, let's rename that from date four to date. So let's get rid of the four there and just call it date. Awesome. Awesome. So click the X again. Oh, click it again. Yep. Great. Now if you click the show logic checkbox, something will come up. You see all those little extra boxes that just came out? It shows you all the variables in the system you can actually reuse somewhere else, whether that's logic, so if, this, then, that, or you can even redisplay it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we want to use their party name and talk to them like they are a human. So in the text box, if you click onto that, um, and we click into the, um, yep, the body there, let's say, um, I don't know, let's say, please disclose the express, express purpose. Please oh, describe? Yes, Yep, well, however you like to phrase it, yeah. So please describe the express purpose between checkbox and. Okay, now this is the key thing. We want to pull in a field that we don't even know the, the value of yet, right? And the way we do that is you're gonna hold down shift and use something that you never ever use on a keyboard, which is why we chose it, double curly braces. Do you know where that is? Yes, that one, cool. And double, so you gotta hit it again. Nice, 
Now, if you type in P, you can see that it's now auto-suggesting all of the variables in the system you can use. Now, you want to select Putty perfect, right? So it says, please describe the express purpose between checkbox and, and I'll insert that name. Beautiful. And we're going to add a tip because I don't know what express purpose means. So if you click on to tip there, beautiful. And you give the tip a title. Maybe you can call it, uh, sorry, the title. So move one field up. Yep. Just call it definition of express purpose, maybe. Yeah. It's all right. Cool. And in the body, um, I don't know how you would define it. You can. A purpose that is expressed. <laughs> Spoken like a true lawyer. Yeah, yeah. To do something, perfect. Okay, great. So now all these boxes right now look red. Red is bad. Okay, <laughs> red is bad. That's why we chose green as our as our color. Um, red is bad. We want to basically fix these errors, and the errors are actually shown. If you click onto that little bottom um, little tab there, yep, just click onto that. It actually shows you in the system everything that's wrong with your build as you build. You want to fix all these. They're, they're basically saying nothing's connected. So we're just going to connect that start screen to the form. So if you just pull that from, yep, so pull from that thing and just drag it into, yep, and just let go. Done. Very good. And connect that to the text. Nice. And just let go. Oh, right into the middle. Yep, that's good. Nice. Very good. Looking good. Now, um, just for aesthetics purposes, because we do have a bit of time, if you click onto text again, let's give that a header just so it's a bit more consistent as we walk through. So we can call this express purpose, maybe. Excellent. Cool. All right. And to finish it off, if you drag in an end block to the end and connect up the start, uh, the text screen to it. Nice. All right. Very good. So we've done quite a lot in less than 10 minutes with a lot of me talking. If we hit preview up there, it will actually now show you how you're doing. So. It says NDA creator, this will help you create an effective NDA. You can put in the variables and it will give you the NDA very quickly. Nice, hit start. There it is, fill in the following information and you can test it out, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I'll just come up with yeah, anything you want, yeah, mm -hmm. totally. We have so much time we're even testing while we're building. How good's that? Okay, cool. Cool, an agreement date, click onto that, yep, it just pops up, great, and you can go next, moment of truth, great, look at that, it says please describe the express purpose between checkbox and Smith P12 today, so you did well, and the definition's there as well, to do something, that's, mm -hmm. that's good. Um, and we haven't, we haven't actually built the final, well, well let's fill out the rest first, let's just okay, come so up with anything for okay. now, we're just testing, um. and we'll do a proper run through in a second. Bear in mind, the NDA has not been loaded yet, right? So <laughs> if you click Next, <laughs> you can see there's that audit log, that, that record there. Um, and if you submit it, nothing will happen. We haven't built the document yet, right? So we're going to finish that off in the last five minutes so we can okay. get some time to deploy it. All right. So if we go um, back to the studio, nice. All right. And I noticed for, for aesthetics purposes, if you click on the form, we didn't give that a, did we give that a title? We didn't. So if you give that a heading as well, just so it looks a little bit, bit nicer when we go through the final demo. Okay, just call it non-NDA or? Yeah, just anything you want. That's really, yeah, great. Okay, so if you click into the end report now and you click into open document builder, this is the document automation interface, right? So this is how you automate your documents. It's very similar to Google Docs. Now we don't want to draft this thing from scratch. You can, but let's not do that. <laughs> let's go into the folder that I have prepared and open up the NDA, oh, it was already open, sorry, so if you just open up to there, yep, and just control A the whole thing, um, yep, and control copy, yep, and go back to the uh, checkbox in Chrome, there, yep, and then just like control V it, whoop, there it is, good, do you have to do anything? Let's double check, if you scroll up, whoop, there it is, so you see all these, um, you see all these kind of flags here, it's telling us there's something wrong because these don't exist. So my poor memory thought it was party name, but it's, it's full name. Ah. So how about you change that now? So if you go into, um, if you just click, into, just click onto full name and you change that to party name, all capitals, yep. Oops. Oh, don't need to do that, yep. Oh, and close off the braces again. <coughs> 
cool, it's not red. It means it works, okay? Short name, we didn't put in a short name field actually, so we can go and do that in a second. In uh, TXT4, you can replace that with um, party name, I believe, right? Can, we can put party name in there as well. Now obviously you want to do this properly the first time, so you don't have to do it individually here in the Word document, that was my fault. Um, purpose we haven't renamed, we'll name, rename that in a second. If you scroll down for a second. Did you go to site to do this thing? You ca in, in checkbox, not at the moment, yeah. And in short name, we'll leave that, we're gonna put that in a second, if you scroll down again, and at the bottom, I think I saw another one. There it is. If you change full name to party name, because that's what we want, a party. Yeah, if you do it in Word, it'll pop it up. Exactly, yeah. Um, and now, what we can do is go back to the studio, and there's two things we want to do, is go back into the form, and this is a beautiful example of how iteration works, right? We're testing it, and then we realize it doesn't work, so we're fixing it on the spot. Still within the time frame, good. If you click Open Form Builder, um, we want to add another field, so if you add um, another text field and call it short name, right, because you know, like sometimes you don't want to refer to it as the whole thing. If you give it a short name, I'm going to tap something on, yeah. Cool, and rename the variable to capitals short name, was I think was what I called it. Beautiful, and it doesn't really make sense for the short name to be that far down the form. So if we click onto that little thing and you drag it up right under the party name, nice, you've re reordered it, good. So if you uh, just close this form, because we don't need it anymore, whoop, and go back to the studio for a second as well, because we need to rename the, the express purpose uh, in there, yep, good. And you see where it says TXT6? Just rename that as purpose, capital P-U-R-P-S-S, yeah, you know how to spell purpose, haven't I? I'm just being nervous. All right, um, <laughs> cool. And you can see everything is now normal colored. I think we've done it. Are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? Yep. Okay. <laughs> I'm so nervous. All right, let's hit, <laughs> let's hit preview. Let's hit preview again. And it's, it's hopefully gonna generate the document. All right, so let's, let's go through. So go ahead, you can fill this in. Awesome, nice. Cool. Okay, it's working so far. Beautiful, go next. <laughs> okay, when we hit submit, either I will have to leave very, so it's done it, right? Can you see that? All the party names are filled in. The express purpose is there. Give her a round of applause. Well done. Well done. And, and there it is. And everything's, everything's there. And then you can send it off to DocuSign and it's all, it's all. And that was built in 16, less than 16 minutes, right? So, so now that's saved forever and I can keep on using that. Yes. Yeah. Now, we're, we're going to deploy it in four minutes. Okay. All right? This is what I'm going to do. We're going to go back. If you scroll back up, we're going to go to the... Um, Go to the, go back to the studio. And if you click on the X, so we're gonna leave the studio for a second, right? And you go, yes, you wanna leave it. Okay, so to deploy it, what we're gonna do is we're gonna mark it as complete. You see that tick there? It's, it's gonna say it's done. That's just to make sure no one else deploys things that aren't done. We then are gonna publish the app, so that kind of, um, yep, very good. And we publish it, nice. So now it's published, and it will ask you, do you wanna create a team? You say yes, I wanna create a team for it, um, we're going to call it whatever you want to call it. Nice. And uh, if you just click next. All right, so we can either choose whether it's internal or external. Let's do external. It's a bit more interesting, right? So we want external people to use it. And you can see you can put a security code as well. It's up to you how, how sensitive is this document. Okay, sensitive. Um, <laughs> good. If you click confirm, because we can assign users, but let's not worry about it. And that's done. If you press copy, and let's just paste it into the browser. Of course, you can embed this in an intranet and things like that, but let's just um, let's put in a new tab so we don't lose checkbox. Um, no one wants to lose checkbox. So let's go and paste it in and hit enter. Yep. Boom. And you can, oh, it's loading. And you can white label this, of course, so it has your color and branding and all that kind of stuff and logo. Um, We've still got two minutes and 30 seconds for this to load. <laughs> 
in the Wi-Fi. I believe it is the Wi-Fi. If we let's let's just um, refresh, like hit a give it another end tile refresh. It doesn't matter. When it, gets, when it gets to a minute, we're going to switch to hotspot and retry it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll have no excuse. All right. So if I just, um, let's just hit enter a few more times, because sometimes, <laughs> sometimes that works. And we paste it in another. Come on. Oh, oh, it's doing it. Wait, is it? I can't tell. It's got two at the same time. Should OK, let's get rid of the old one. Let's get rid of the old one. Is it, is it hotspot time? All right. All right, we can do this. We can do this. I believe so too. Um, oh no, I'm on, I'm on one bar. I'm on one bar as well, so let's see how we go. Okay, one bar reception. Let's see how we go. This is, I told you, high risk, but we, where is my Wi-Fi? Where's my hotspot? Oh, I'm connected now. That's me. My, uh, mine's iPhone. Sorry yeah. about the joke. <laughs> non intended. Okay. All right, let's, let's just kill that and. <laughs> now, this is all hotspot. Come on. Yeah. Ooh. It's doing it. I will narrate the rest. How about that? <laughs> so, so essentially, what you saw happen will be the same here, except it's deployed as a link. And when it does load, um, I'll let you know in a week's time. No, that's the other one. Um, I'll, when it does load in a week's time, I will let you know. Basically, because we've set a security code, you will need to be... Did it load? Hey, nice. All right. OK, so we've got... If we go in... 24 seconds. Grab that code. <laughs> copy it. Put it into the, put it into the, paste it, hit start, and I don't think we need to run through it because we don't have time. But you've done it, so we, we've, uh, we've deployed it. I'm shaking. That was awesome. I hope you guys enjoyed the session. There we go. That was that was my timer. Um, hope you guys enjoyed. <laughs> Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this session, and um, yeah, if you want to find out more, please come and Can talk to me. Can we just say thank you? Yes, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.